Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gil Pruce, and I'm the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm proud to welcome you to our webinar, which we are presenting in proud partnership with the Montgomery County Transition Workgroup. We're pleased and excited to offer this session as part of today's Road to Independence Virtual Resource Fair and to be able to continue this important work during a time of physical distancing. The Jewish Federation has long prioritized building an inclusive community. A big part of that work has included a commitment to connecting individuals and families to programs and services and providing a roadmap for our Jewish organizations and community members to raise awareness and advance inclusion for those with disabilities. In addition to today's virtual fair, I encourage you to explore our jconnect.org site, which offers information and resources focused on disability inclusion for both individuals and organizations. An inclusive community is a stronger community because it benefits from the perspectives and participation of every single member. While the coronavirus pandemic has had a devastating impact on our community, I believe it has also taught us a valuable lesson about the importance of inclusivity. Our virtual events have brought our community together in ways we haven't gathered before, across geographic boundaries and in groups larger than those who may have been able to come together in person. We have also seen the importance of investing the necessary time and resources in ensuring that all of our virtual events are fully accessible and inclusive. When these virtual spaces are truly open to all, we will continue to benefit from the diverse and thoughtful voices who join us within them. Today, I'm excited to hear from Arielle Hinton, the Assistant State's Attorney from Montgomery County. She will be talking about how to be smart and safe while navigating social media, an especially important subject as more of our lives are transitioned to an online environment during this time. But first, I am proud to introduce Karen Leggett, the Transition Workgroup Chair. Thank you very much, Gil, and thank you to everyone at the Jewish Federation for hosting our regular fair and our online fair. I indeed chair the Transition Workgroup. This is a coalition of more than 30 parents, government agencies, organizations, and service providers. We're committed to improving the transition of young adults with intellectual differences and autism to work, higher education, and greater independence. Each year, we hold two resource fairs. Our spring fair is hosted by the Jewish Federation, and this year, this fair is online. We hope to be having our in-person fair on November 14th. You can see the link in the chat, and that is where you will find all of our member organizations ready to provide services, opportunities, and opportunities to share your questions. Here is what the fair uh, page looks like. You can see you can connect to the virtual library of materials uh, and all of our organizations are listed alphabetically and you can click on each one to see the services they're offering. Many are offering special services online during our coronavirus pandemic, but they all also have many, many programs helping our young adults in transition. And we know as adults that transition doesn't just happen one time in your life, it keeps happening over and over again. We already have a longstanding Facebook page and, and we list resources and events there, but we have a brand new Let's Talk Transition Facebook group. And we're gathering members every day and we encourage you to join. This will be more of a place for conversation. So if you see a post on which you'd like to comment, you may do that. You may also post questions and raise topics, anything you'd like to discuss with other people in our community. So please do take a chance to visit both of these, uh, both, of, both of these pages and you can get everywhere from the link on the, uh, in, the, in the chat. A few notes about today's conversation. You'll see uh, a toolbar at the bottom and if it disappears, just run your cursor across the bottom and you'll see it again. If you would like closed captioning, you'll see that, you may click that on. If you have questions for Ariel, please post them in the Q&A 
And if you would like to make a relevant comment, please include that in the chat. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Ariel Hinton is indeed an associate, an assistant state's attorney in the Community Outreach Division with the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office, where she's been for about 11 years. She has also served in the District Court, Juvenile Court in Domestic Violence and in the Felony Division, and she served as a judge in Teen Court. During her legal career, she has also worked as Deputy Counsel to the Governor of Maryland and at a private law firm in Washington, D.C. Ariel graduated from Tufts University and Temple University School of Law, and she speaks French and Haitian Creole. So thank you very much and welcome, Ariel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the Jewish Federation as well as to Karen Leggett from um, the Transition Work Group for inviting me here today to speak with all of you. Um, it's been great working with um, both organizations. You guys have been um, truly helpful in getting all of this together and I'm honored and humbled to be here with you today. Um, all right, um, we're gonna be going through a lot of information. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and we can get started. Okay, hopefully you guys can see the screen okay here. Um, so as I think we said before, this um, presentation is called Social Media Savvy. And we're just gonna go through some of the different um, things that you guys can do to remain safe and to protect yourselves um, while you're on um, social media. So if any of you have ever been um, you know, the subject of, bat, of rumors being spread about you, or if you've been the person to spread rumors about somebody else, or if you've ever sent a picture of yourself, a picture of someone else and thought right after you do it, I wish I could take that back or said something that you wish you could take back, um, or ever stood up for someone being bullied or been bullied yourself. Uh, this presentation is for you. And let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go through a couple of things, primarily cy cyberbullying, um, and then we'll get into sexting, which is a new and sort of, well, I can't even say new, but it is um, something that is happening quite a bit, and we like to make sure that you um, know how to protect yourselves from that. And then we'll get into the consequences of these different types of um, actions, as well as the golden rule. Um, so first, uh, we all know that, I'm sure all of you have different types of um, electronic and social media from Facebook to Twitter, um, YouTube, everyone goes on these different social media platforms. Um, and they're great for keeping us connected, but they're also kind of um, a new medium where people can um, get in and do things to try to harm one another. Um, and some of the things you need to protect yourselves from are, or, or know how to deal with is making sure you don't overshare information, making sure you don't put inappropriate or say inappropriate things on social media. So cyberbullying, we're gonna talk about that first. So the definition of cyberbullying is the use of technology to bully, harass, annoy, bother, or torment another person. Um, there are lots of different examples of cyberbullying. Some of it can be verbal, which is the same as normal bullying, people saying mean things to you. Um, the difference is now they're saying them over these new types of mediums, using tweets, using emails, using um, text messaging. Um, so some different types of examples of cyberbullying are when people are sending um, offensive messages, um, either about you or about someone else, and if they send it about someone else, they're expecting that you're gonna go ahead and share that um, as well to other people. Um, so these messages can be, um, some might seem very harmful, others might be very aggressive um, in the things that they say, like things, saying things like, I wish you would die, or you're ugly, no one likes you. 
Um, so those are sort of more, more kind of in your face types of comments that people make, but there are also um, some more subtle comments that they make, but because they say it so, infre so frequently, um, that that's when it gets to the annoying and harassing and really just emotionally um, bullying of someone. So why do people cyber bully? Um, there are lots of different reasons. A couple of them are sometimes they're trying to impress, you know, their friends. They maybe want to fit in with a different crowd, um, be popular. Sometimes they're doing it just to be mean, um, or maybe they're trying to get revenge um, on someone who did something mean to them. So those are some of the reasons that people might do it. And there are a lot of other reasons. One of the main reasons is really because social media has made it a lot easier for people to be mean, quite frankly. 81% um, of adolescents, teenagers, um, young adults believe it's easier to get away with bullying online than in person. Because obviously when you're in person, you're face to face, it's a little harder to say, you know, to, to say whatever you might want to say when you're angry, when you're upset, um, or because there are other people around and maybe you're embarrassed to say those things around other people. Um, so, so you might not do it if you are actually face to face with that person. This, these new types of mediums um, give people a lot of um, courage to say the things that they otherwise might not say if they were face to face. Um, the fact that not only can they, they play something online or post something online like a photo, um, but then they can distribute that to a much larger, larger audience. And so now, instead of saying it face to face where it's just you, now it's multiplied because it's sent to maybe 20, 30 people in your school. And then that gets even bigger because those friends are sending it out to, to someone else. So it gets very difficult to ignore these um, messages for the victims as they're coming into them. And one of the biggest things about cyberbullying um, or a main thing is sometimes people are pushed into doing things that they don't otherwise wanna do. Um, and that can ruin friendships. So this is a video I want you guys to listen to um, that basically um, explains that, that uh, circumstance. I used to have a best friend named Katie. We shared everything, even our passwords. One day I got online and noticed a bunch of emails from someone whose name I didn't recognize. The subject was, you look hot. I opened one up and read what it said. It was from a guy at school who was two grades older than me. He said he wanted to do stuff that I'm embarrassed to even say. These girls at school, the beautiful people as I call them, they convinced Katie to give them my password. She thought that if she gave it to them, it would make them like her. I think she was scared too. These girls do mean things to everyone. Anyway, the girls got into my email and sent emails to all the senior guys that looked like they were from me. In the email was a picture of me with no clothes on. They got a picture of someone else from an adult website and photoshopped my class picture headshot on it, I guess. Then they wrote things like, I will do anything to make your fantasies come true, and signed my name. Since it came from my account, everyone thought I really sent it. Now I can't go anywhere at school without guys looking at me funny and people whispering and pointing at me when they think I can't see. I don't have any friends, and I don't even talk to Katie anymore. I feel so alone. I wish I could move somewhere and start over. I thought it was safe to share my password with my best friend. Now I know you can't. I wish I could disappear. Okay, so that was obviously just a video, just an example of some of the things that um, can happen to someone who's cyberbullying. But there's some very important um, information in that video. One being something as simple as sharing um, her password with her best friend who she thought was going to keep it safe and protected um, didn't. And maybe it was because she was bullied into giving that information up. But that's why it's so, so important for you to make sure that your passwords are um, kept safe 
that you're the only person who knows them. Maybe you need to write it down somewhere just in case you um, forget it, but make sure that wherever you write it down, that that is also in a safe place, that nobody can get to it or no, no one can figure out what it's used for. Um, and even though that was just an example, it is very, very real what um, that video is displaying. And these things happen, and it happened to Grace McComas who was a 15 year old who ended up committing suicide because of how much she was bullied. Um, as a result of the bullying, even though they knew who the person was that was bullying her, um, nothing happened to that person legally because at the time there were no laws on the books for cyberbullying. And um, fortunately, um, the loss of Grace McComas um, motivated her parents and the legislature. And so there were laws, there is a law now that has passed um, on cyberbullying. And as a result of that law, um, it is now, if you are found guilty of cyberbullying, um, you could face up to 10 years in jail as well as a $10,000 fine. Um, here's it was Easter Sunday in 2012 when Grace McComas took her own life because of cyberbullying. Seven years later, a bill with her name on it gets an upgrade. Grace's parents were in Annapolis today to witness the bill signing. WMAR 2 News' Don Harrison joins us now with more on Grace's Law 2.0. And finally, we're enacting Grace's Law. That is Governor Larry Hogan before he signed 195 bills into law. One of them is Grace's Law 2.0. The law was named after Grace McComas, a 15-year-old that committed suicide after constant online harassment. Grace's parents, Chris and Dave McComas, were on hand for the bill signing. Grace's mother recounts how vicious the online bullying was for her daughter. I hate, 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 hate you. I hope you see this and cry yourself to sleep and then kill yourself. There is no changing the past, but this can change the future for other families. This will protect future children from the types of things that we couldn't protect her from. We've kind of democratized content, so now everybody has the power in their own hands and there's no more... You know, you don't have an editor behind you, and people can say whatever they want to a wide audience, and something has got to control that. All over the place with this keyboard courage, you know, a bunch of cowards sitting in their basement in the dark. You know. Senator Bobby Zirkin was the Senate sponsor of the bill, which cleaned up a few loopholes from the previous law. Now you don't have to wait for several occasions of online abuse to report it to police. One message, and you can act immediately. Somebody is sending out horrific things about a child, that family, the victim's family and the child can walk into court and get a peace order. So it can get it stopped right then and there. A stronger law that may make it better for all. If they have a deterrent that might actually have some, you know, weight to it, that can help hopefully. We'll curb some of that behavior. That it matters how you act in public life. It matters how you, what you say to people and what your words are. In Annapolis, Don Harrison, WMAR2 News. So um, in addition to um, the law that was passed on cyberbullying, I do want you to know that there are also um, additional laws um, that have been on the books for a while, but if something doesn't rise to the level of cyberbullying, um, but for example, you're getting a lot of um, emails, um, there's a law um, which you can see here is misuse of electronic mail. Um, or harassment and stalking, people who are either physically following you around and stalking you that way, or they can be stalking you by phone, um, which, is, which would fall under the misuse of telephone facilities, um, or they're harassing you by doing all of those things, um, you know, following you around physically, emailing you, texting you. Um, then all of these other laws are also in place. So if it's just one thing that's going on, you know, as a prosecutor, I can charge the one thing that's happening, or I can charge several of them, or I could even charge the cyberbullying, depending on what the facts um, and circumstances are. Um, so let's talk about for a minute now what you can do as, you know, an individual who either observes cyberbullying going on or um, is, you know, the subject or the victim of um, bullying or cyberbullying. Um, this is the difference between being an upstander and a bystander. So this is going to be a video here about what it, what it means or what it is to be a bystander. Um, and that's basically just someone who 
Um, as you can see in the video here, someone is videotaping it, another person's watching the video, uh, watching what is taking place, which is the bullying. Um, and l I'm going to play this so that you, you guys can hear it. Kids get bullied every day. That's just the way it is. Sure, schools have policies. My school has a policy. Yeah, that's worked out real well. I am not a bully. And I'm not a victim or a target or whatever they call kids who get bullied. I know I should probably do something, break it up. But really, it's none of my business. Okay, so in this case, um, you know, this person was observing what was going on, didn't really know what to do, didn't even know if he had to do anything or should do anything. And certainly in these circumstances, you don't have to do anything. Um, but I certainly would encourage you um, to try and be an upstander. And this video, this next video is about being an upstander. Why don't you pick up the phone? This is pissing me off. Nobody treats me like this, especially you. You do not want to get me mad. Number one, I told you not to go out. Number two, why haven't you called me back? Are you stupid or something? Call me back. I can't believe the way she's treating me, man. The way she treats you. Speak up. Just because it isn't physical doesn't mean it's not abuse. Okay, so between those two videos, there's a lot of information. You saw one that was about um, physical bullying, um, and then this one that you just saw is about verbal, verbal bullying or verbal abuse. Um, the things that this um, boy was saying to this other person, very aggressive, very mean, um, and not, not the way you should be speaking to anyone. Um, and so the difference here in this video, this is what we would call an upstander. Um, even though it's very um, short, what the young boy who was playing the video games and was listening to what was being said, um, all he said is what she said to you, or what, what yeah, what she's doing to you. Um, that's a way of making sure that the boy who was being verbally abusive, um, it's a way of saying, hey, maybe you should think about what you're doing and what you're saying and whether or not you are doing something wrong to that other person. Um, and the fact that he said something and took it upon himself to say something, you know, he's not getting himself into the middle of a fight if it's a physical fight. And that's not what we're encouraging to, you to do. But what we are encouraging is if you see something, say something. So if you overhear someone speaking um, meanly or rudely or being abusive to another person, there are lots of different ways that you can help. You can help by either going to make sure that that person's okay, going to seek a trusted um, friend or adult um, to let them know what's going on. Um, certainly if it's something that's going on at school, then you can go and talk to an administrator or teacher at school to have them step in and do something about it. Um, you can just go and talk to that person to make sure that they're okay. And all of those actions are actions of an upstander. So even though the, the bullying might take place, there are ways that you can help that victim um, or yourself um, by making sure you reach out to someone and make sure that they know how to get help or you know, you know where to go to get help. So the next topic we're gonna talk about is um, sexting. Um, so this is, well, we'll go to the next slide. So basically sexting is sharing sexually suggestive content, videos or photos using any form of electronic communication. Um, so lots of people take pictures of themselves, lots of selfies, um, and then they post it on their Instagram or their TikTok or their um, Snapchats and so forth, all of those different um, media forms. Um, this is really about not posting inappropriate photos. A selfie of you, you know, at the, you know, at the gym or something like that isn't an inappropriate photo to post, but there are 
inappropriate things to post. And those are, I, those are photographs of you naked, photographs of you in very sexually suggestive positions or in just sexual positions. Um, and that is what um, the law is trying to prevent. It's trying to prevent obscene matter from being distributed or um, published um, on these different social media platforms. And these are, there are consequences to that type of behavior. And so I wanna make sure to let you guys know that and make sure that you're protecting yourself, um, one, from doing it yourself. So don't take pictures of yourself in those sexually suggestive positions and then post them on social media. It's even, even if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you send it to them, um, that is, you know, a lot of people do that, but then that person, if you break up, can then send it out to a friend of theirs or end up posting it on social media, which then, and in turn, ends up hurting you because certainly you don't want that information or those photographs out um, about you. So here I've just listed some of the different um, laws with regards to um, obscene matter being published. As you can see, that's a misdemeanor. It's punishable up to one year um, and a $1,000 fine. Um, child pornography is a felony, which is punishable up to 10 years with a $25,000 fine. Um, and then possession of visual representations of children under the age of 16 um, that are engaged in certain sexual acts. That is also a felony and punishable by up to 10 years um, or $10,000 fine. So if you, if somebody happens to send you any of this type of material, that's something that you do not want to then publish to someone else. Um, that is not something that you want to post online. You want to delete that as soon as possible. Um, you know, get rid of it um, so that you're no longer in possession of it and definitely don't distribute it to anybody else. Um, some of the things to remember with um, posting anything on social media, um, whether it's words that you post, photographs that you post, um, photographs of other people that you post and who you send these, these um, pictures or photos to is once you hit send, you have no control over what has been sent. You can't take it back. You can't delete it. Even if you delete it off of social media, social media holds on to those images, holds on to that information pretty much as far as we know indefinitely. So it can always be looked at by, you know, um, or found rather um, by people who are very good with technology um, and, and these types of different uh, social media uh, platforms. So just be sure to keep yourself from becoming a victim by declining to send any type of um, nude pictures in the sense of sexting, but also anything that's gonna, you know, dehumanize, demoralize, or bully someone else. So revenge porn, I sort of talked about that, but that's basically the photographs that you send maybe to an intimate partner, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a significant other, um, things that you send to them in the, the um, course of your relationship. If that person then uses that to in some way to get revenge upon you, that is also a crime. Um, and that I've detailed here as well. So if you find yourself in that circumstance, um, you can call the police, let the police know, um, and there might be charges that we can, depending on the facts and circumstances, that might be something that we can charge. And that um, revenge porn crime is a, um, a misdemeanor with a two-year um, possible imprisonment and a $5,000 fine. So let's talk about some of the consequences of all of these types of actions. I'm going to go through a few. Their educational consequences, their personal consequences, their um, uh, pro professional consequences. Um, so we're going to go through a few of them. And these are two videos I'm going to play for you that talk about the educational consequences of um, social media and, you know, using social media inappropriately. 
what you do on social media has consequences. A group of Harvard-bound students found that out the hard way when comments they made on a Facebook group chat got their admissions offers rescinded. Those comments were deemed sexually explicit and racially biased. Some teens find punishment for their actions online chilling. The fact that, you know, that's taken away from you just because of what you post, it's really, it's crazy. You telling them they can't say a certain thing is kind of telling them they can't speak their mind at all. You may be able to say what you want, but there are consequences. Dr. Karen Williams is an educational consultant. She spent 15 years working as an admissions officer. What we don't want to see is um, damaging material, um, abusive, violent, um, discriminatory material on social media from a 12th grader. It speaks to the judgment and um, the maturity of the applicant at the time. William says beware of what you post on social media and what you email and text. Experts say parents can help their children avoid social media pitfalls by preparing them before they go online. What if everyone in school saw this? What if my grandmother saw this? Am I going to be okay with that? If the answer is no, you shouldn't post it. I would tell them the same thing, not to go on social media and put that garbage on there because it can haunt you later on in life. Parenting experts say start teaching your children as soon as they get a tablet or smartphone and always monitor their online activity. In Manhattan, Elise Finch, CBS 2 News. Well, this is not the first time a university has taken action against students for postings on social media, but it is the highest profile case so far. Experts say parents can help their children avoid social media. Sorry about that. We're going to move on to the next slide. So the, those um, videos discuss some of the educational consequences. Um, so if you're trying to, if you're going from high school and applying to colleges or trade schools, um, you should be aware that they will be looking at your social media. Um, it's part of their process of, you know, sort of weeding out who can come in and who can't come in. Um, so just make sure that things that you post are um, appropriate um, and things that you say, um, like they mentioned in here, are not, um, you know, too provocative that might cause somebody to raise an eyebrow and say, mm, we're not sure if this person used good judgment in posting these things. Um, and uh, one of the ways I like to um, talk about it is, just as uh, one of the women in here said, if you are, um, if you are not comfortable showing either a parent or friend or guardian, whatever it is that you wanna post or send, or you don't want them to read it, then, then there's probably something inappropriate in there. And if there is, you should remove it um, and then have someone review whatever it is that you're posting or sending to make sure that it is appropriate and that it's the type of information or statement that people won't take the wrong way. What you do on social media has consequences. Should I get to the next one here? All right, sorry about that. Um, so those were educational consequences. This video here talks about some of the professional consequences. So now this is when you're um, looking for those jobs or in those jobs, um, and it can happen both, both ways. You're applying to a job, people are gonna be looking at your background um, and looking at your social media to see what type of person you are. And even while you're in some jobs, people might be um, looking at these things. Let's talk for a second about losing a job before the interview even happens. It is possible, and it's happening to people now who don't even realize it, and in many cases, it's all because of their social media. So tonight, Jeff Paul explains what to look for in your own internet presence to help protect you at work. It's where we share our memories, our photos, and sometimes our opinions. But when it comes to social media, some of us might be sharing too much. We're not only looking at the types of comments that they're making, we're also looking for spelling, grammar. It's an online resume. Job recruiter Jolene Rich says when a new applicant comes in, she starts with Google. Who they are 24 hours a day is important to the company. She then checks the obvious places, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. 
Rish watches for unprofessional photos, curse words, racist or sexist comments, red flags. She says companies want to know about before the candidates walk into the interview. We're not fishing for bad content. She's also checking how often they're posting on social media. When you see that someone posts, you know, three, four, five times a day. You're wondering, well, shouldn't they be working? But just the opposite is also a red flag. If I can't find someone at all, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is this person who they really are? Dallas-based Fortune 500 company Southwest Airlines hired close to 7,000 people last year, and recruiters use social media to find many of them. Look at your social media from the lens of an employer and say, what would people think about that? State Farm's new North Texas hub at Richardson saw 2,000 new hires in its first year and still has hundreds of empty desks to fill. The company says it uses Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to engage with potential hires before hiring events. You should always Always be prepared and have a proactive approach to make sure you're uh, keeping in mind that the job field is really competitive and you want to make a positive first impression whether that's in person or online. Even if your social media footprint isn't so clean, it's not too late to spruce up your online profiles. Hit delete. Delete is your friend. UT Dallas social media professor Janet Johnson says what you share becomes your brand. Do you have a lot of drinking pictures on your profile? Are you cursing on Twitter? Are you complaining about companies? Are you complaining about your boss? Johnson says if you wouldn't show a picture or recite a post to your boss, it shouldn't be out there. One tweet can ruin your life. On well, deleting old photos and comments will help Johnson says creating a professional presence on the web will too. Instead of like cutiepie at gmail.com, have a name, Janet Johnson at gmail.com. She says changing privacy settings are an option, but if you're questioning a post, it's best not to hit send in the first place. Data doesn't die. Everyone has a camera phone now that you can easily take a screenshot of anything. Now, experts say the other tip is to create a LinkedIn profile or to start making daily posts that are more professional to put some of those inappropriate posts from the past further down. Doug and Caitlin? Yeah, three people sitting here like, no. delete, delete, delete. Exactly. <laughs> it's, like, delete. <laughs> it's, you know, it's good advice, and the reality is today we thought it was just a problem for our kids, but man, adults are in this game too it's now. Real. Everybody's got to watch out. It's yep. good advice. Thank Thanks. you. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, I like how they ended this video, which is this is across the board. This is for adults, it's for younger people, um, and it's good information for you to have going forward to make sure that you're protected from uh, being a teenager and young adults all the way through um, adulthood and in the older years. So um, one thing to know with the, you know, in your professional life is a lot of jobs that you'll go um, on will do background checks. Um, and so they'll be looking at not only this information, but they might be talking to people to find out, to get information about you or the type of person that you are. Um, and um, a lot of, um, especially if you're going to the federal government, a lot of the federal jobs also require security clearances where they do a lot of this background checking and um, making sure, talking to people to make sure that you are someone who they think would be an appropriate fit for their job. Um, so those are the educational and professional, but they're also- well, Let's talk for a second about losing a job before the interview. There are also personal consequences um, to, you know, these inappropriate posts that, that you might um, post yourself or that others might post about you or um, that you might receive and then send off to someone else. Um, and, you know, sometimes after you send it, as I said before, you start to feel guilty, right? Maybe you're, you were mad at one moment and you got into a fight with someone and then you texted something really mean or posted something on their Facebook page or, or um, that was really mean, um, but you can't take that back. So, one of my suggestions is anything that you write before you post it, um, either, you know, take a day to make sure, especially if you're angry, take a day, go back to that post, read it again, and then think to yourself, do I really want to send this or is this, um, you know, a lot more mean, it's meaner than I thought it would be, or it sounds a lot more mean now than it did before or have someone review it before you send it so that um, they can tell you, oh, that sounds really 
um, mean or that sounds really inappropriate and you can kind of gauge it that way. Um, so that those are some thoughts. Um, now, I want to get into some of the other kind of um, pitfalls that some people fall in. And it's not really by any mistake that you do, but there are some ways to avoid um, these scams that are on the internet now. Um, and they can be scams that, you know, hackers use. They're scams that people are trying to hack into your, um, for example, your uh, bank accounts, trying to take money for you, from you. Um, so all of these, um, these are called social media phishing scams, basically. Um, and some of the ways that you can avoid these things are to make sure that any site that you go on um, is, you know, the real or official site that you need to be on. So, and, and also when people are sending you things, um, if someone, if you get an email from someone that says click on, on this link to go to this, this next place, um, this next post, make sure that whatever you're clicking on, you know what it is. And some of the ways to do that is when, if you know the, for example, if you're shopping and you know the name of the company, you can just go directly to the company's site if you know it and just type it into a new browser rather than clicking on whatever someone sent to you. Um, and that can be true of emails that are sent to you. If there's a name in there that you know um, the, com the name of the company and they're saying click on this link rather than click on the link, just go to open a new browser and then go into uh, you know, type in whatever the name of the company is to see what comes up and to make sure it's the official site that you're going to. Um, and especially if you don't know who the senders are. Um, if you get an email from someone's name, you know, from a name that you might know, but if the email looks different than what you remember, then that might not be the same person. Um, at the bottom of this um, uh, slide here, you can see an example with a Yahoo. If you get a Yahoo, I think most of us know Yahoo is Y-A-H-O-O, -O, um, as opposed to the two zeros. So you, you would automatically know when, while looking at it, if it's something that you're familiar with that, oh, that's not the site that I'm supposed to go to. So instead of clicking on it, just go to um, a new browser and click on to what that link is. So um, these are scams that are coming up and that are constantly changing. Um, so you really have to keep an eye out for, you know, the language that is used in some of these social media um, scams. Um, is the language uh, correct? Are there spelling mistakes or typos? All those things are kind of a, um, a way for you to gauge whether or not this is a safe um, or, or good site to be on. One of the other um, scams that are taking place now, um, or have been for a while, is uh, catfishing. And that has a lot more to do with dating sites. So um, if you are on any of these dating sites, you just also want to be very careful about the type of information you share. Because you might not know who the person on the other side of that phone or you know tablet or computer is. Um, they might be pretending to be you know, the man of your dreams or the woman of your dreams and it ends up being, um, you know, somebody else who is really out to harm you or to take your information so they can use your information against you. Um, so it, on the slide you see, you know, just be cautious with what friends requests you accept. If you don't know who the person is, if you're not familiar with that person, it's probably best not to accept the friend request. Um, don't share any personal information with people that you don't know. So your home address, phone numbers, where you work, um, that's all information that people can use to try to find you and, and do uh, and harm you in some kind of way. So you don't want to share that information either unless you know who it is that you're talking to. Um, and one of the examples down here is if you're interested in a person on one of these dating sites, um, request to have them video call you if you have that option with your um, technology um, so that you're sure that who you think you're talking to is actually the person that you're talking to. Okay, so the golden rule. So these are all posted here for you guys and I'm just gonna read through them. And basically it's like I said before, think twice three times, four times before you send or post anything. Do not give out personal contact or identifying information to online strangers. 
Um, pro do not provide passwords to anyone other than your parents. Do not send nude pictures or videos of yourself. And furthermore, don't share anything that you get, any naked posts of other people to anyone else. Um, do not write something about another person that you wouldn't say to them in person. Do not share content that could damage or humiliate another person. And don't use abusive language. Those are all the types of things that employers, schools, and so for, forth are looking for um, to, to help them determine the type of person that you are. So here are some ways to be safe online. Do keep your password private. Um, be careful with what friend requests you, re you accept. Um, do report inappropriate posts. Uh, review anything um, before you send it or post it. Um, Google yourself to see what others, such as professionals, see about you. I've actually done that myself to see what people see when they Google my name. When they Google my name, um, have family or close friends review posts before putting them online, um, and do tell a trusted adult if you or someone you know is being bullied. Um, one of the ways you can see on the slide in the little photo. Um, to think about these things before you do any of them is anything before you post anything is um, think T is it true H is it helpful I is it inspiring N is it necessary and K is it kind um, and that's just a little tool that you can use before you post it just go through this and think to yourself is this the type of thing um, I should be posting is this the type of thing that I want other people to be reminded of um, when they think about me. Um, so that is pretty much all I have here. I think we are going to go to some questions. Um, so I'll be able to take those now. Thanks. We do have a, a few minutes to take some questions. So please type your question into the Q&A um, or you can put it in the, in the chat. I do have one question from one of our attendees. Okay. Who asked about cyberbullying on video games. Can that happen and, and what can you do about it in cyber games? Yes, so these cyber, these, these games um, have the ability for you to, and, there, and it depends on the game as well, but some of them, you, you know, people have their headphones on and so they're actually talking and communicating to the other individuals on the other, you know, in, in the game. Um, so they might say, hey, you know, I'm going after this guy and you go after that guy and they can communicate about what they're doing online. Um, there, they also, some of these games also have chats similar to the one that we have right here on Zoom where you can write comments. And some people are very negative um, in those um, gaming rooms. Um, sometimes people get upset or get mad about um, oh, you didn't kill that guy when you were supposed to, or you let that guy kill me, and so they get upset. So one of the things that you can do is you can see if that, um, either that video game or the, the um, producers of that video, if they have one of these, you know, report, um, report, reporting sites, so you can go on there and report whatever was stated or um, said, or if they wrote something in the chat, you can identify where it is so that they have knowledge of that. Um, sometimes the, the gaming um, producers will not allow people to get back onto those um, gaming systems, um, will not allow them to get back into that video game to play or will ban them for a certain period of time. So you, you, there are ways that you can prevent it. I mean, this, the, probably the safest thing is if you're communicating with someone on one of these gaming systems and they're not being appropriate or they're harassing you in any way or being negative towards you is to just not play the game or at least not play the game with them. Find some other friends to play the game with. And if we have one more question, if you're over 18, do you have to let your family know you're using a dating website? Um, no. So <laughs> tricky question. So, you know, in, in our country, when you're 18, you are considered an adult. I think it's, um, I think it's okay to share that information with your, whoever your trusted adult is. And so sometimes your trusted adult may not be your parent, may not be your mom or your dad, but maybe it's an aunt. Maybe it's just a good girlfriend or boyfriend, or maybe it's, um, you know, the parent of one of your good friends. 
Um, so you're not required to disclose that information, but it might be something that you want to talk to your family about, um, really just to keep yourself safe um, and make sure that, you know, if you're, if you certainly feel comfortable going on these dating websites, um, I think it's, it, it's a good idea to have just a frank and honest discussion with your parent or guardian or um, just to let them know that this is going on just in case something ever happens. They at least know that that's a resource that they, they can go to um, if, if questions start being asked or if, or if some bad things start happening. Or if, for example, you start getting negative cyberbullying messages from this person, they won't, they won't even know where to look to find those messages. So it's not required by law um, but I think it is a discussion that you might want to have with your family just to keep yourself safe. Uh, we have one other comment on the video games. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you can disable the chat feature and just play the game and disable the chat. So um, yes. that's, that's, possi that's a possibility. Yes. I did. So I don't know. The chat's all closed up. Right. And I don't know if that's a possibility for all, right. you know, that's gaming true. sites. I'm not a gamer, but I do know that that is an ability that you have. So yeah, that, that's a, actually a great suggestion. So thank you for that. Whoever said that, that is a great suggestion. You can just disable the chat. So that's not a problem. And, and one, one last question. What if you have someone that you normally work with, maybe a job coach or uh, someone, a colleague, and they're contacting you too much. They're just, uh, too, too much, maybe not, uh, maybe not necessarily harassed, but they're just contacting you too much. Right. Um, yeah. So there's that, that balance that I was talking about, uh, you know, when is too much or too often, you know, does it get to that level of annoying and bothersome or is it actually harassment um, where it's sort of over the top and that, that really is. Um, so what we would do as prosecutors is we would take all of that information um, really to see, you know, is two text messages in a day too much? It might be if they're extremely negative or violent or threatening text messages. Um, you know, and that's a little bit different than someone who's getting like 25 text messages from someone a day, where maybe they're not being... Um, you know, violent or threatening or saying negative things, but the, it's just annoying and it's harassing. So both of those things could be the type of case that we prosecute. It just depends on the content and what's in there or, or how many, you know, that you have. Um, so we would have to gather all of that information. So it's hard to say right off, but it could be one, it could just be one text, one email, um, one statement. And that might be enough for us to prosecute it. And then it, on the other hand, it could be we need 25, you know, if does it reach the level of harassing, we might need 25 of them to be able to prove that if it's not quite the level of, um, you know, if it's not based on what they're saying. So it really depends. If you are having questions about it, definitely talk to someone about it. If you don't feel comfortable going to that colleague or uh, I, that would be my first suggestion is to go to that person. If you feel comfortable, if you don't feel comfortable, then I wouldn't do it. But if you feel comfortable going to that person and saying, hey, um, you know, yesterday I got 10 text from you and it's too much. I ha I'm getting a lot of text. I can't, you know, handle all this information at once. Can you, you know, limit it, you know, limit how many times you're texting me. See if you can have an open and honest conversation with that person about what's going on. And, and that might be enough to just get them to stop. Good enough. Thank you. We're going to need to stop there. We're out of time, but uh, thank you very much for the questions and thank you to everyone who attended. Again, in the chat as the link for the virtual fair, as well as the uh, Let's Talk Transition face Facebook group. I'm going to open a topic on social media savvy in the Facebook group. So if you have questions or tips, please add them there. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And thank you to the Jewish Federation and to Ariel Hinton. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.